Hello, party people. I am back to give you uh, an interpret some interpretive assistance on an article by uh, Hillary Parsons Dick, or as we call Professor Dick in the club, H P D. I'm sorry. I'm just kidding. So I'm a longtime fan of her work, uh, and I just got her book, which I'm going to shamelessly plug right here because it's a badass book, and you should read it. Um, but the article we're covering today is titled Imagined Lives and Modernist Chronotopes in Mexican Non-Migrant Discourse. So this is a tough read. A lot of big words in here. Um, if you want an easier version of this article, then check out the first three chapters of her book. Um, of course, it's, it's easier, but it's also way longer because it's expanded over three chapters. Um, so we got a couple really big words in the title, and that's what we're going to focus on in this in this video. The word discourse and the word chronotope. So this is about what she calls migration discourse. So a discourse, uh, very loosely conceptualized, includes talk about something or some kind of theme. Because it includes talk, it necessarily is about people and groups of people who talk about the theme migration. So the concept discourse can be really huge and we can include the, uh, in this concept, we can expand this idea of discourse to include a lot of stuff. Um, it can include, for example, text on billboards or newspapers or migration stories on the evening news. Um, even this article, which is about migration discourse, can be included in the discourse called migration discourse. Um, but Hillary Dick narrows what we're talking about uh, by saying we're talking about migration discourse that comes from non-migrants, um, which is an area that's vastly understudied. Hillary Dick says migration discourse emerges through the idea of a modernist chronotope or modernist chronotopes. So chronotope is another one of those giant words and it's absolutely key to understanding this article. So a lot of articles will tell you, uh, oh, a chronotope means time space. So chrono, chrono, time, uh, tope, space. So, okay, fine. Uh, what does that mean? And why is it useful in analyzing stuff? So, we have to go beyond just simply identifying chronotopes, and we have to look at what chronotopes are capable of producing. Now, I'll tell you a simple list that I try to remember um, all the time when I'm reading about chronotopes and what chronotopes produce. They produce possibilities, constraints, and likelihoods, or unlikelihoods also. Uh, so if you notice, there isn't anything definitive here. It's, it's about likelihoods. But think of chronotopes as clearing a path from our present into the future. A path that is easier for some and more difficult for others. So let's take a simple chronotopic moment and work from here. So chronotopes uh, comes from literary theory. Uh, so let's use a literary example, real simple one. Um, think of the opening phrase, once upon a time, that magical phrase, once upon a time. So what is the time and the space that's being invoked when we say that, once upon a time? Perhaps uh, it's a magical place, magical space. And it happened in a magical long time ago. So that's that time space right there. The phrase ascribes preconditions for what can come next. So think of that as clearing a path from that moment into the future. Um, it sets up possibilities, constraints, and likelihoods. But even so, it's not totally determined. 
So what if I said, once upon a time, during the presidency of Barack Obama? Okay, sure. I can say that. I just did. But that is not a likelihood. That's an unlikelihood. Um, it uses a real time and space. Um, so the United States, just a couple years ago. Um, the once upon a time, chronotope, invokes a story model that is supposed to go a certain way. Uh, we know this because it's passed down to us through uh, from history, right? But also, when we invoke chronotopes, we expect things to go a certain way, meaning we lay a path for a possible future. Um, an absolute key aspect of chronotopes is that it also constrains and makes possible a particular kind of character to come out in these stories. It forges a path for characters to walk. So can I say, once upon a time, there was a president named Barack Obama. So yeah, that's not really a magical character, right? That's not the kind of uh, magical being that a once upon a time chronotope invokes. So it's not impossible, but it's less likely. Um, important for chronotopes, though, in this article is that, for example, once upon a time also invokes a set of morals. So a lot of times these stories oppose good versus evil. Um, our characters have to position themselves in this moral imaginary world. Because in the story, they have to do stuff, right? They have to make choices. Um, so chronotopes clears a path for our characters to take, um, to make choices that affect the future of the character and the story. So we got time, space, characters, morality. So for this article, we got these main elements. We got time, we got space, we got imagined people, characters, and morality or moral worlds. And these chronotopes are deployed from the perspective of the non-migrant. Uh, they are the speakers. They are the storytellers. Uh, so if we think of migration discourse as a way people lay down their stories in everyday talk that is guided by, by the paths chronotopes lay out, those once upon a time moments, we can see people making sense of their lives with respect to our main elements, time, space, imagined people, moral worlds. One of the most powerful chronotopes, or set of chronotopes, identified by Hilary Dick is the modernist chronotopes, which is made up of a here, which is the place where non-migrants live, uh, Mexico, and a there. Uh, which is the United States. So you got this opposition set up where Mexico, the here, is also the rural and is also associated with a traditional morality. Remember those moral worlds. And that is set up in opposition to the United States, the there, um, which is um, imagined as urban and also imagined as immoral. But don't forget that imagined characters live in chronotopes. So when people invoke these chronotopes, they might imagine the paths that they can take in life. Um, so we'll often see people position themselves as aligning with or relating uh, with some of the characters that live in these chronotopes. And remember, these characters um, make moral decisions. So uh, people might 
relate to that set of morals too. So not just the character, but the set of morals that imagined person is imagined to have. So when we talk about chronotopes, we're not just saying that is a chronotope. We're not just identifying the chronotope. Um, we're also paying attention to the way people imagine possible paths into the future. So things we might expect to happen, things we, we might want to happen. And as Hilary Dick so brilliantly explains, depending on who you are, on what social class you occupy, uh, what generation you come from, this will make certain paths more likely for you to take or to advocate for or to oppose whenever you participate in a migration discourse or in the migration discourse that she's talking about. And as if the analysis wasn't complicated enough, she reminds us the gender of the person talking is crucial, which means the gender of our moral characters that live in the chronotopes, they also have a gender. So, to review, when you pick up this article, or when you read it again, because you probably will, um, I, I know that I've read this article probably four times. This is at least the fourth time I've read it. So think about those once upon a time moments, those chronotopic moments as being loaded with constraints, possibilities, and likelihoods. And then you remember that those chronotopes come loaded with an imagined time, an imagined space, imagined gendered characters, and also a set of morals. So just remember all of that. Real simple. Okay, so good luck once again. I'm Mike. Uh, be sure to like the video if you dug it. Until next time, I'll see you around.